So uh, this week, we're very happy to have Anurag Singh, who's going to speak about uh, Henkel determinant Thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. I'm, I'm hoping people can hear me. And if not, perhaps one of the panelists or someone should alert me to this. Um, so I hope everyone is well and safe. The topic for today is Henkel determinant rings. And um, when I selected this topic, I was supposed to be uh, the intention was to uh, speak in David's seminar physically in Berkeley, but then of course uh, times have changed and, uh, and here we are. So um, I, I, I chose the topic because it's closer to uh, some of David's papers and his interests, but uh, thanks to all 106 of you for logging in. So let me start with, uh, so the topic is Henkel Determinantal Rings. But let me start with some, first with some classical determinant rings. And even before that, throughout K is going to denote a field and all the rings under consideration will be finitely generated K algebras. And in fact, uh, even graded ones. So a quick recap of some classical determinantal rings. So start with an M by N matrix of indeterminates. And set R to be the, poly the polynomial ring in those indeterminates modulo the ideal generated by the size T minors of that matrix of indeterminates. So just as a check, um, can people hear me and are they able to read? I can see the panelists, so a thumbs up or something would be, uh, yes? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, um, these so-called generic digital rings that we've written down, rings of, of the form R, uh, such a ring is a subring of a polynomial ring as follows. One could take matrices of new indeterminates y and z, where y is size m by t minus one, and z is size t minus one by n. In which case, the product matrix yz has rank t minus one, so it's size t minus a zero. So this gives us uh, an isomorphism between the ring, um, between the determinant ring R as we first defined it, and the subring of a polynomial ring in the y's and z's generated by the entries of the product matrix. Anurag, there was a, a suggestion to write a little larger, if you can. Okay, I'll try, yeah, we do. And if the field K is infinite, this is an invariant ring for a group action on the polynomial ring. Where the group G is the group of invertible matrices of size T minus one. Um, I'm just checking on the charts to see if uh, there are there's anything I should add this. Uh, and the action is an invertible matrix M takes the entries of Y to the corresponding entries of Y M inverse, and for Z, the, the entries of M Z. And Note that 
This is set up so that the entries of YZ are indeed fixed. Um, I should add uh, that the class group in this case is the infinite cyclic group. And this is a theorem of Winfried Bruns. So these were the generic determinable rings. Moving on, one can play a similar game with um, the minors of a symmetric matrix. So we set R to be defined by the, the size D minors of this, in this case, symmetric matrix. This once R is one, um, again, it is a subring of polynomial ring, specifically um, so the subring of the polynomial ring in a matrix of indeterminates Y that has size P minus one by N and it's an invariant ring if K is an infinite field where the group this time is the size T minus one orthogonal group and a matrix element as a group element takes the entries of y to the corresponding entries of ny. The point, of course, being that the entries of y transpose y go to those of y transpose m transpose ny, and since it's the orthogonal group, group those entries are fixed. Um, this one's the divisor class group is Z mod two, and that's a theorem of Goto. I should add, in each case, I'm uh, choosing the integer t, the, si the size of the minus, to be something such that the setup is meaningful and the end result is not simply a polynomial ring. So that's uh, that's implicit in the previous example and subsequent ones. Um, the third of the classical de determinantal rings take a square skew symmetric matrix of indeterminates and R to be the ring defined by the functions of that matrix of a specified even size denoting 2t. So in this case, the subring of a polynomial dis ring description is of this form where y is a 2t minus 2 by n matrix of indeterminates. And omega is this uh, standard symplectic block, I guess of size um, 2t minus two so that the multiplication is, makes sense. So once again, it is an invariant ring And this time for, sorry. Um, the symplectic group of size twice t minus two. The action being the entries of y go to the corresponding entries of my so that Y 
Y transpose omega Y gets sent to that. And since M is an element of the symplectic group, the, the product in the middle is precisely um, our standard symplectic block omega. And this one's the device, these rings are unique factorization domains. Get back on, right? Hello? Yeah, yeah, we are on. Okay. We can see you. Yeah, I lost the screen for just a, I, uh, uh, so these are unique factorization domains, and that's a result of Lucho Abramov. Um, questions at this stage, perhaps conveyed by the moderators or in the chat room? There's no questions yet. Okay. I'll let you know. Thank you. So, In each of the three examples that we have listed so far, the classical determinants of ring that we denoted by R, it's normal. There was one question about the situation when K is finite. So I'm sorry, David. So when, uh, these are invariant rings in the case when K is infinite. But, but the normal Cohen Macaulay and the fact that they are subrings of polynomial rings in a natural way, all of those hold independent of the field. Was that your question, David? I think the question was what, hap what goes wrong with the in ring of invariance? I see. Sorry. Oh, yes, I see the question. Yeah. Uh, if, if K is uh, a finite field, then the um, invariant and action is as we specified, then there are many more invariants. Specifically for a finite group action, the, the ring on which the action takes place and the invariant ring are the same dimension. So, one, um, so to, make this, to, to formalize that, one would need get, to get into absolute invariants, et cetera, which I'm going to sweep under the rug in this talk. But certainly the, the things that are being listed right now, the normal Cohen Macaulay, et cetera, are applicable independent of the field. So in each of our examples, the ring is normal with Macaulay, and in the case of characteristic zero, the ring has rational singularities. I should say I'll subsequently abbreviate Cohen Macaulay by CN. Um, and In the case of positive characteristic, the rings that we're talking about end up being F regular, if you're familiar with that. Coming back to the characteristic zero setting, um, in each of our cases, the group G that we took is linearly reductive. So the classical determinant ring R in each case is a pure subring of a polynomial ring. I'll define the phrase in a minute. Um, The homomorphism of rings is, is said to be pure if it's injective when I tensor with any R module N. So in the 
characteristic zero situation, all of the, each of the classical determinant rings that we listed, they're pure subrings of polynomial rings. And the properties that we mentioned, cohere polynomial rational singularities, they all follow from Guto's theorem that states that for finitely generated algebras over a field of characteristic zero, The property of having rational singularities is inherited by pure subrings. Now, I should probably um, at least briefly mention the definition of, rank of rational singularities. And so normal domain R is set to have rational singularities if for a desingularization by going from X to spec R, the higher derived images, R I pi lower star O X are zero. And this definition, um, may not mean much to you if you're seeing it for the first time. So let me give a, um, a, a, something that uh, um, perhaps helps. So here is a, let me call it a possible conjecture. I've not seen this written anywhere as a conjecture and I'm not even sure if it's true, but I certainly don't know a counter example. So let's, uh, Um, but this is to sort of um, guide you about what Russian similarities might be. So let R be a normal domain that's finitely generated over a field of characteristic zero. Then R has Russian singularities if and only if each pure subring of each polynomial extension is going to call it. So I honestly don't know if this is a reasonable conjecture, but let me just say that I don't know a counterexample. So uh, That being said, let me move on. Okay, now to get to the topic of uh, um, today's talk, Henkel determinantal rings. So by a Henkel matrix of indeterminates, We mean a matrix in which the diagonals in the chosen direction are constant.
So Henkel matrix of indeterminates is one where um, the diagonals as we have written down are constant and by a Henkel determinantal ring, we will mean one that's defined by the minors of fixed size D of such matrix. So as an example, Um, that simple matrix, as is and it's an easy exercise that um, for each of these two matrices, if I form the ideal of size two minors, then those ideals are equal. Um, it's not true that the precise set of minors is equal, just that the ideals they generate. It's readily verified in this example, and more generally, that's a result of Rousseau and Pesquini. Rousseau, as you know, passed away earlier this month. So if I have a R by S Henkel matrix and I'm looking at size T minors, then as long as T is less than or equal to each of R and S, it's the same ideal if I were to take a T by R plus S minus T Henkel matrix of the same variables. So this turns out to be uh, really quite useful because. Uh, Anurag, before you continue, there was a question about your conjecture. Yes. Can you go back to the conjecture? Yeah, it's, um, it's only a possible conjecture. So, so the question uh, is. One, one direction is answered by Bhutto's theorem that's up, that's at the top of page five. Yeah, the question seems to be, is one direction uh, clear? Yes, the one direction follows from Bruto's theorem. Did that answer it? I hope. Okay. So sorry, as I was saying, the, um, because of this uh, um, lemma from a paper of Rousseau and Peskin, it's enough to consider Henkel determinantal rings that are defined by maximal minors. And this turns out to be quite advantageous, as we will see. So by maximal minors, I mean they've got a size T by N Henkel matrix of indeterminates, and we're going more the ideal generated by T by T minors, namely the maximal minors. So the advantage here is suppose we take a generic determinantal ring of the same size. And we subject the entries of y onto those of our Henkel matrix. Then the then the kernel is generated by. Um, 
by the specializations that we have to make to make the diagonals constant, uh, specifically by elements of the form y i j plus one minus y i plus one j. And these form a regular sequence in the generic determinable ring. So in other words, the exhibiting these as uh, using maximal minus as the advantage that these are generic determinable rings modulo a regular sequence. So, um, so in other words, we're taking linear sections of determinable varieties. Um, the phrase is in quotes because that's the title of a paper of David Eisenberg, where he studies uh, linear sections of determinate varieties, Hinkle, and much more. And what I want to take away most from that paper for the moment is uh, the fact that these Henkel determinate rings are normal, as is proved in Eisenberg's paper. Um, in addition to the normality, of course, the, the fact that we are considering a generic determinable ring and going mod a regular sequence tells us that these rings are cohen macaulay and one can quite easily count the dimension, et cetera. It's twice t minus t. Um, next. So, so these rings are normal and cohen macaulay and that's been known uh, for a number of years. Uh, next, let me move on to divisor class groups and start with a small example. So I'm going to write the two by four Henkel determinable ring. I'm taking maximal minus as we always can. And you'll recognize this as the as a very major subring of a polynomial ring. polynomial ring in the indeterminates u and x. And this is the homogeneous coordinate ring. For the four ripple embedding of P1. Now, the divisor class group of such a ring is amongst the first examples one studies of divisor class groups. It's Z mod four generated, for example, by the entries of the first row in this U to the four U cube X formulation. So that's um, a choice of a generator for the divisor class group. And the other elements of the divisor class group are of course the higher symbolic powers of this prime ideal.
And they're, they're exactly what you get if you take that first row and you truncate it from the moving in from the right. So that's the second symbolic power. For the third, we truncate once again. And for the fourth, we truncate once again until we arrive at the, at the principal ideal as we must if the divisor class group is Z mod four. So the good news is this extends completely to, to Henkel determinal rings. So let R be um, Henkel determinal ring defined by the maximal minors of a T by N Henkel matrix. Then the divisor class group is cyclic of order N minus T plus Q and As a generator, one may take the maximal minors of the first T minus one rows. Um, so that serves as a generator for the device of the class group. What are the other elements? Well, they're obtained exactly as in the four-opal embedding of P1, as, exactly as in that example. So in other words, for the second symbolic power, Drop a column moving in from the right. For the third power, drop a column once again, continue. And until we end up with the size T minus one minor, rather the determinant of a square matrix. That being the power of P that must be principal if you believe the part about the class group. So um, the answer resembles the uh, the rational normal curve as closely as it possibly could. And just as with the rational normal curve, um, here is something that I find quite interesting. Each element of the divisor class group, each symbolic power of P is, a, is an MCM R module. just as it is for the rational normal curve. Now it's interesting to compare the, uh, the class group and the MCMs between the Henkel case and the generic determinantal case, which is what we, which is what I'll do next. So by the corresponding, I mean, for the Henkel, we've taken a T by N uh, Henkel matrix and gone with the maximum minors. So that's what I want to do in the generic situation as well.
Now, for generic detrimental rings, the divisor class group is infinite cyclic. And an infinite cyclic group has two possible generators. One and negative one. So as generators for the class group of the generic detrimental ring, we could take the ideal of maximal minors of the first t minus one rows. or its inverse, the ideal of maximal minors of the first t minus one columns. Now, with that notation, the maximal element, the, the MCM, the maximal when we call them elements of the divisor class group, are few enough to fit in this line. A is the ring itself, and that's uh, Gordon Macaulay. B is maximal Gordon Macaulay, although no higher power of B, in this case, the symbolic powers and the ordinary powers are equal in the generic case. No higher power of B is an MCM. Q is also an MCM. Q square is Q to the n minus T is, and that's and everything in between. And then one more. I say one more because this one is the canonical module, so it must be an MCM. But beyond that, there's exactly one more that's an MCM. So it's, uh, there was a question about what uh, on the previous page, which ones were MCM? Uh, on the previous page, so in the Henkel case, every class group element is an MCM. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, in, in the Henkel case, uh, when I wrote P to the symbolic I, I should have specified every possible I, every possible element of the class group is an MCM, which is quite different from the generic case where the list is uh, finite. In other words, almost all elements of the divisor class group are not MCMs in the generic case. Now, as we map, now as we map from the generic to the Henkel case, we are going modulo a regular sequence. So the MCMs map to MCMs. And in fact, we will hit every element of the class group of the Henkel. And we'll have to hit one twice because this class group has ordered n minus t plus two. And here we have listed n minus t plus three elements. So E of course maps to the Henkel determinant ring R. The, what we called, uh, um, uppercase P here maps to what was fractal P in the Henkel case, our fixed generator for the class group there. And when you get to Q, something interesting happens. So That's supposed to be my T by N rectangle, my T by N matrix. And let's say that's, that distance is about T as well, let's say. So Q is the maximal minors of the first T minus one columns. So Q is the maximal minors of the red rectangle. But in the Henkel case,
that corresponds to the, this green rectangle. So, but the symmetry that we gain in the Henkel case, Q maps to the ideal of minors of one of these truncations of the first T minus one rows, namely the penultimate truncation. Um, from there on, one can do a bit of a calculation. Q squared, which is also, which is the same as Q to the symbolic two, maps to something isomorphic to the symbolic n minus t th power of p, and so forth. Q to the n minus t, namely the canonical, maps to something isomorphic to the second symbolic power of t, which is the canonical module for the Henkel determinant, and the last one is a repeat of p. Um, so the pigeonhole principle is not false. So that's the story with the uh, with the divisor class group. Um, this is probably a good time to take some questions and and or perhaps a short break. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yeah, um, we can hear you. Is this, is this a, uh, yeah, so this, as, as I was saying, this might be a good time for questions and then a quick break, perhaps. Well, no one else can talk besides the panelists. Uh, so I guess if, if you have questions, <laughs> type them and we'll get Here's to a them. question. Do you get any um, Ulrich modules this way? Which of these are Ulrich, if any? I don't know. Um, what, what's the answer in the in the um, Russian normal curve case? You, so O of um, minus one is Ulrich, or the you know the sum of the cohomologies of H uh -huh. zero, and I think that's the only one. Um, so yeah, you have to twist it up, of course, to get sections. So it's OP1 of minus one, but it appears uh, with sections in, in the rational normal curve of degree D, mm -hmm. you'd have to say OP1 of D minus one to get sections. And I believe that's all we hear. None of the others are. I see. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer. Uh, I, I, um, I don't know the answer, but it's a good question, yeah. Other questions? I have a comment. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you undoubtedly know this, but of course, in connection with your conjecture, yes, um, the uh, the cohomology of a structure sheaf in the graded case, yes, uh, uh, can sometimes be embedded in a uh, the local cohomology of a segway product, preventing the segway product. Yes. I'm, being called Macaulay, I mean that. It, correct. So one can, one can prove some cases of the conjecture using that idea, and that's that's in fact the only the only basis I have for the conjecture. That's not a conjecture, but quite you are right. Yes, that's uh, uh, that's right. That's. Uh, so are you relabeling it a question? Well, I mean, uh, I try to be as you know. Uh, I probably do a possible conjecture and then put some further quotes around it or something to make it uh, as nebulous as I could. <laughs> it's a guiding principle, perhaps. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Should we say reconvene at 320 or something or? Yeah, that's up to you. We can, okay, so we'll take a two minute break. Is that what you? Sounds good. Let's do that. Great. I, I put down this uh, possible conjecture to. Um, um, illustrate one, one sort of potential way to think about rational singularities. And Mel pointed out that one can um, 
indeed push that to a, to a, to a, to a formal statement um, in the graded con in, in, uh, in some cases in the graded context. So most, most definitely for you know uh, graded isolated singularities, etc., by by the the the, the cohomology that obstructs a ring from having Russian singularities, one can embed that in the cohomology of a segregate product. And I'd phrase the statement as a pure subring of a polynomial extension. So in particular, the a segregate product qualifies as that. So one can you know, uh, prove at least cases of that possible conjecture using uh, graded ideas and segregate products. That was Mel's uh, uh, comment. I hope I... I hope that was accurate enough. Yeah, I have one other comment. You know, uh, in all, I think in all the cases where you're using pure subrings, they're actually direct sum ends. That's which that's I, right. think, yes. I think is an easier thing for people who aren't familiar with purity to understand. Sure. Thanks, man. I had one quick comment about the Ulrich module question. Yes. If uh, if it's correct, the, the number of generators of the Q's, squared, Q cubed, et cetera, they're all increasing, I believe. And the number of generators doesn't change as you cut down. And they're all rank one in their respective rings. So since, since the number of generators would have to be the multiplicity, the only possible one would be the one with the most generators which would be at the end, but then it would have to be P since that maps to, is that correct what I'm saying? I think so. Um, so, I mean, I, we, we, do, we do record the multiplicity in our paper. So, I mean, I, I'm not sure I want to do this in real time, but one could. Uh... Well, I didn't want to compute it. I just wanted to point out that's the only one that could possibly be correct, I think. So, so, uh, so, the situation would resemble rational normal curves as in there's exactly one that is Ulrich. Is that correct thing? I'm just saying the number of generators has to keep going up as you go. Correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah in That's the all. rational normal curve, I think there's just one. Okay. And it's, it sounds like it might be the case for uh, Henkel rings as well, although that's, it, I mean, it, 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 yeah. To be confirmed, but I think that looks uh, likely. Um, other questions before we move on or continue? So now uh, in the we had seen the classical determinantal rings uh, as subrings of polynomial rings in a natural way. And I want to uh, express Henkel determinantal rings as subrings of polynomial rings as well. So So now, once again, let's uh, um, start with uh, with a small example. The four ripple admitting of P one, we had this could be expressed as the Veronese, uh, the fourth Veronese of a polynomial ring in two symbols, and we listed the generators before. But let me write them this once as. Let me arrange them as a three by three Henkel matrix. So what the, these elements, then of course there's repetition, but these would serve as key algebra generators for the 
fullable embedding of P1. And surely the size two minors of this matrix are zero. Now, if I take new indeterminates, let's say V and W, and I form the corresponding matrix in those variables, of course, the size to make the size to minors of that new matrix are also zero. So what if we add these two matrices? So I'm adding two Henkel matrices, so the, as in the diagonals are constant, so the same remains true for the sum, and I'm being somewhat lazy about filling in all the entries of the matrix, but what we did here was add a rank one matrix and a rank one matrix, so their sum has rank at most two. Other, in other words, this three by three matrix that we wrote down, its determinant must be zero. This means that if we take the three by three um, Henkel determinant hypersurface, we can map, we can, that surges onto the K algebra generated by the entries of this um, previous matrix. So this is a K-algebra surjection, and then by a small dimension count, once um, since each of these rings is a domain, a small dimension count settles that this is actually an isomorphism. So in this manner, we've obtained our Henkel, our three by three Henkel the temporal ring as a sub ring of the polynomial ring in the variables U, V, X, and Y. And um, the same sort of thing remains true in full generality. And there's something more that should be said. So what we're doing here is really, we could think of the two matrices as corresponding to uh, the matrix in the U's and the X's, and then in the V's and the Y's. We could think of these as corresponding to different points on our rational normal curve. And then we're taking the linear span of those. So the, the, the key algebra, the, the subring that we have written down at the very end, that's really the approach of that is the secant variety to P1 and P4. And this remains true in good generality. So the T by N Henkel determinant ring It's isomorphic to the K subalgebra of a polynomial ring in twice T minus two variables. Generated by
elements of this form where the exponent j is whatever range keeps the exponents non-negative. And that, and as a safety check, this means that j can take n plus t minus one values. So the subalgebra has n plus t minus one generators, which is exactly, which is precisely the correct number for the t by n Henkel determinable rank. So that was a safety check that worked out pleasantly. Um, and akin to the description in terms of second varieties, what one gets is that the approach of the P by N Henkel determinable ring is the um, or the T minus two sequence variety to a certain rational normal curve, namely P1 in P n plus, the n plus T minus to it um, upper embedding of P1. So in this manner, uh, every Henkel determinable ring is a subring of a polynomial ring and in a reasonably natural way, namely in terms of this uh, higher order sequent variety description. Um, I may not have given that polynomial ring a name. Let me do that now. Polynomial ring S. That's over there. And as we'll see next, aside from the case of rational normal curves, the Henkel ring is not a pure subring. So when T is three or larger, the Henkel determinant ring is not a pure subring of the polynomial ring um, under the embedding we've just finished discussing. So let me illustrate that in the three by three case and the argument uh, um, in the general case is really quite similar. So in the three by three case, we expressed the a uh, three by three Henkel hypersurface. As the key algebra generated by the listed elements. inside this polynomial ring that we're calling S. Now, each of these rings, R and S, has dimension four. But if you look at the maximal ideal of, the homogeneous maximal ideal of R and extend it to S, then if one were to specialize the, uh, u to x and v to y, then all of the generators of the Henkel subring take the form x to the four plus y to the four after that specialization. Said otherwise, the maximal ideal, its expansion lies in this three generated ideal of the ring S. So if you were to look at the inclusion of R in S, Sorry, and tensor with the 
the Doppler cohomology of the ring R. The end result is Sorry. Um, tension with the local homology of R gives me this. Now, the module to the left is non zero, as since it's the top local homology of our ring, meaning supported with the maximum ideal with the cohomological index being the dimension. On the other hand, the module to the right is zero by Hachshon Lichtenbaum vanishing. So that tells us that R is not a pure subring of S. It's not a direct sum of S as an R module. And this argument, uh, continues for larger Henkel rings as well. So the only time you get a pure subring under this embedding is in the rational normal curve case. So this means that it's hard to conclude, it's hard to apply, uh, at least at the moment, Butos theorem and such to conclude um, properties for Henkel determinable rings, but nonetheless, we can get pretty close using the circle of ideas. So consider um, a T by N Henkel determinable ring over a field K. Here's what we can prove. If K has characteristic zero, then R has rational singularities. If K has positive prime characteristic, that's at least T, the T being the smaller of the dimensions of our Hinkle matrix. Then R is F rational, meaning that parameter ideals equal their type closure. And in positive characteristic, but with no additional assumptions. R is F pure, meaning that the Frobenius, the Frobenius endomorphism is a pure ring map. So um, a word or two about the proof of this. So two implies one by a theorem of Karen Smith, rings that are F rational for infinitely many primes. Um, the corresponding characteristic zero ring is, uh, has rational singularities. And to prove to Thank you. 
it's enough to prove that one parameter ideal is contracted from our polynomial ring S, where R was embedded in S as before. This was our Henkel ring as a subring of a polynomial ring. So, and I want to sketch how that goes. So once again, uh, part one of the theorem is immediate from two by a theorem of Carol Smith. For two, namely proving that parameter ideals are tightly closed. It's enough to do this for one parameter ideal, rather to prove that one parameter ideal is contracted from this larger ring S. And um, let me sketch that again in what has more or less become our running example. So that's the three by three Henkel hypersurface. As a system of parameters for this, we could take x1, x2, x4, and x5. And uh, if one goes mod these circled parameters, one ends up with a ring uh, where one is killing x3 cubed. In other words, The Sokol mode of our chosen system of parameters is spanned by x3 square. So I want to prove that the ideal generated by this system of parameters is contracted from the ring S. When I expand to the ring S and contract, it doesn't get any bigger. And for that, it's enough to show that the Sokol does not get into the expansion contraction. Now, in our subring coordinates, the corresponding elements are u to the 4 plus v to the 4, u cube x plus v cube y, u x cube plus v y cubed, and x to the 4 plus y to the 4, and x3 square corresponds to the square of the missing generator. So what we want then, what we need to verify is that this, the chosen circle generator doesn't belong to our parameter ideal expanded to S. Now the parameter ID expanded to S, that's the ID generated by those four elements. And it's immediate that this is contained in the ID generated by U, U cubed, V cubed, X cubed, and Y cubed. That ID contains the, these four generators. Seems like a loose bound, but that's good enough to do the job. Because when we take the, when we expand, when we take the square, what we have here is that. So the middle term is not in the ID to the right. as long as two is not zero. So this might seem rather naive, but it's precisely why we needed this hypothesis. Um, in our example, T was three, and if the characteristic is three or more, um, the calculation proves a rationality.
So as long as we have a knock on characteristic two, um, this argument works. Um, in general, the circle may not be one generated. It will not be aside of, from the square cases, but uh, some variation of this argument does the job to wrap up uh, the theorem. So in the, in the uh, last few minutes, let's discuss, I want to discuss um, the following question. If it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, walks like a duck, is it really a duck? It's a tiny. It's a tiny. It's a leo walking duck. So, so, Hentel determinant rings share several properties with pure subrings of polynomial rings slash characteristic zero invariant rings. The things we began with, normal, coherent Macaulay. Better still, Russian singularities. The class group, Henkel rings as finite, in particular, finitely presented. So what I have at the back of my mind here is that uh, for a connected algebraic group over the complex numbers acting on a polynomial ring, the invariant ring is finitely presented. Here it's finite. And something that's true more generally for pure, for pure subrings of polynomial rings is that Finite order elements of the class group are MCMs. And the word finite is underlined here since you've seen examples of invariant rings where class group elements are not MCMs. So Henkel determinant rings have um, Several features in common with characteristic zero invariant rings, but the question remains, are they ducks? Um, thank you very much, the participants. Thanks a bunch to my co-authors, uh, whom I was, some of whom I was hoping to visit uh, this month, but uh, of course, all travel is on hold, but uh, I'd like to, I mean, I had, I had their names up on the first slide, but I didn't say it out loud. Aldo Conca, Mural Mustafa Zadifad, Mathieu Barbaro. It's been a lot of fun working with them on this project. With that, uh, questions from the participants. Hello. There's nothing so far. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them and we can address them now. Or I can speak. Uh, sure. So uh, when we talked about this last, uh, it seemed that uh, F regularity would follow if it were true locally um, after localizing at one of the indeterminates. But I take it you still don't know about that. 
I still don't know about that. Um, localization is, uh, um, I mean, uh, I mean, in the uh, uh, in the in the classical determinant rings, the localization tricks end up being more easy to follow through. Yeah, it seemed like you'd have to enlarge the class of rings you're considering quite a bit. That's right. So, so I've tried it some, but it's it's still. Uh, I mean, in general, we still we expect it, but we don't know the answer. So so. Um, to Congratulations on visiting Michigan just before the pandemic hit. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was the last of the travels and, uh, <laughs> yes. So, uh, um, so we certainly expect all Henkel the tentative rings and positive characteristic to be F regular, uh, but that's just an expectation. We can prove it in several cases um, using, you know, sort of, uh, in, in, in some cases, using some uh, a global basis argument, in other cases, using cyclic covers and the like, but the, the general statement is still not uh, there as yet. It might be that they're F regular without being pure subrings of polynomial rings, of course. Th that's right. So at the, at the moment, in fact, I'm reasonably, I mean, if I, have to, if I had to bet money, I would, uh, I would guess that they're not ducks, so to speak. Well, <laughs> in the characteristic zero situation, they're not pure subrings. Um, but it is. And, and I would bet that they are F regular. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, well, it seems that there are no further questions from the attendees. So, I guess we can uh, adjourn. Um, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I guess you can do a virtual applause in the chat. Um, otherwise, um, I hope you will join us next week. Um, Mike Stillman will be our speaker. Um, Thank you, everyone, and I'll stay safe. Ciao. Thank you.